Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm Stuart Harrison. I'm a uh, web developer at, um, at the Open Data Institute, and I'm here to talk to you about Open Development, Open Data, and the Open Data Institute. So, what is the Open Data Institute? Um, we were founded in um, 2012 by Tim Berners-Lee, um, who some of you may know, and uh, Nigel Shabbot, who uh, is um, who works at the University of Southampton, uh, Sir Nigel Shabbat, as well. Um, and we're a non-profit, non-partisan um, organisation. Um, we were we were set up pretty much. We we set up with uh, I think it was ten million pounds worth of match funding over five years, um, and our aim is to help others be successful with open data and deliver economic, social, and environmental value from open data. But you know, what is open data? And, uh, and what, um, the simplest way to describe it is information that is available for anyone to use, for any purpose, and at no cost. Um, open data must have a license to say it's open. It's not enough. I mean, it's very nice if you want to put some data out there and say, here you go, guys, have, have it, have at it. But you really, um, to maximise reuse and maximise guarantees, you must have a license to say it's open. Um, examples of uh, open licenses are Creative Commons Zero, um, Open Government License, etc. Um, uh, but the license can impose some constraints. So you've got um, Creative Commons, Commons Attribution, or Share Alike. And Share Alike is, is a license where you say you can do whatever you want with this data, but any data you create from this data must be must be shared under the same license. Um, and there's a, there's a list of all the uh, licenses that meet the open definition over there. Um, and the Open Knowledge Foundation, who, uh, who put the uh, open definition together, they say that. Uh, that's how they describe open data or, con or open content. So what? Why should you care? Um, as a consumer of open data, um, Open data frees you up to do cool things without having to pay for the data or, or collect it yourself. And as a data owner, if you um, if you have a lot of data and you're not uh, um, and you're not uh, excuse me, sorry, um, I've just got to close IRC because people are bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite off putting. Um, as a data owner, um, because. Um, your clients and customers will probably start to care and probably start to ask you questions of why, why, why isn't this data open? Um, so there's some examples of uh, some interesting data sets, um, uh, open data sets and how they've been used. Excuse me. Oops. <coughs> um, so this, um, this was done by, a, uh, by an intern at the Ordnance Survey, uh, one of their summer interns. Uh, built a Minecraft representation of the whole of Great Britain using Audience Survey open data. Um, this is some work that we did but with one of our, uh, the startups we incubate. We, we have um, around about six or seven startups uh, that work within the ODI. Um, we provide them office space and, um, and, and, and other benefits. Uh, and the, they generally work with, well, they, they must work with open data. Or produce some open data, and this is one of our startups, Mastodon C, who, uh, together with Dr. Ben Goldacre, who some of you may know, um, uh, they analysed open prescription data from the NHS to see how much was spent on expensive branded medicines. And this, uh, this, this concentrated on one class of drugs, which the Daily Express like talking about, statins, um, and it identified a £200 million saving um, from prescribing generic statins rather than branded statins. Um, this is uh, our first project involving open data from uh, the private sector. Uh, we worked with uh, a number of peer-to-peer -peer lending um, organisations as well as the Bank of England um, showing where the uh, lending is coming from and going to. And you can see that the majority of money is going from um, from the South East and London. And if you, you can also see how receiving, and that, that map almost inverts. So you've got less money going into London, more money going into the North West and the North East and the Midlands. Um, and this is uh, some work done by one of our startups, Anchor Corporates. 
Um, they do lots of really, really good work on um, opening up uh, company data sets. So uh, things like Companies House. That, that's how they started out um, opening up the data. Well, uh, taking in the open data from Companies House and making it more reusable. Um, and then they carry it under data on over 60 million companies from around company registers around the world. Um, and they mapped out data on corporate networks uh, with countryside altered by uh, the number of companies in the, uh, um, the number of com companies in that particular country. You'll notice what that, that rather large landmass there is actually the Cayman Islands. <laughs> <laughs> and all the links from other companies, uh, so you can see a lot of a lot of companies go via the Cayman Islands to other countries uh, to avoid paying tax. So, what does good open data look like? Good open data can be linked to, so it's easily shared and talked about. And this includes um, if you've got uh, a data set with lots of identifiers. It's always better to have a UR, to use a URI rather than a number, so you can so you can link to it and you can easily share and know what know exactly what that thing is that you're talking about. Um, it's available in a standard, structured format, so that can be anything from uh, a CSV file uh, or even Excel, but probably best not to, uh, up to up to XML or uh, or RDF um, linked data stuff. Uh, it has guaranteed availability and consistency over time. So, if you um, if you put a data set out there, uh, you ideally you want to say you know th this is a this is a one point in time data set. We're not going to be releasing loads of others, or you can use um, and you will guarantee that it will be available for forever, or you tell people it's not going to be available forever. And uh, consistency as well. So if you release uh, a data set for May, make sure it's in the same format as your data set for April, for example. Um, and it's traceable for end of processing, so others can work out whether to whether to whether they can actually trust this uh, this data set and trust what they, what's what's been said. So uh, how can you check this? Uh, this is one of our first uh, first projects, Open Data Certificates. And it's a, it's just a simple questionnaire that allows data, data publishers to identify the legal, technical, social and practical things to make it easier for people to reuse data. And it's not just an award that you stick on your website and say, yeah, our, our open data's um, got a certificate. It's a tool that shows you what good open data looks like. So it's it's almost like if you were starting out from, from nothing, you could use open data certificates to make sure when you publish your data, that you are doing it, you're, you're doing it right, and you're making sure that people can get the uh, the best out of it. So it's the legal, technical, social, and practical things. And um, this is a this is a tool that we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's it's currently in alpha, and it allows data publishers to check if they're publishing um, CSVs in a way that maximises reuse. So that is, that is the structure good? Um, are, uh, are you sending correct HTTP headers so people know it's CSV? Um, because I think we um, one of the one of the things that we that we've noticed is if you look on data.gov.uk, the vast majority of data sets are published as a CSV because it's very easy to get out of an Excel document. So you know, save as CSV, put it on data.gov.uk. But that's not always the best way to do things because. A CSV, a CSV is not a spreadsheet. It's common separated values, and it's uh, they, the two things are very different. So this is just to help people. And we've worked in conjunction with um, with a lot of data publishers in uh, in government to uh, to help us shape this tool. So going back to what we said before, um, the ODI is non-profit, non-partisan, but but our main aim is helping others to be successful with the data. But how do we do that? We Incubate startups, as I mentioned before, we uh, we provide um, <coughs> we provide office space. We provide. I think the space is really helpful because you're bringing together a lot of expertise in one place. Uh, I noticed on my first day um, at the ODI because I've I've worked in open data um, for quite a long time. My background is in local government. Uh, I worked for Litchfield District Council for 
nearly 10 years. And um, so a lot of people that I, I got to know, um, and I saw at least three or four people on my first day that I, that I knew from my hanging around the open data scene. And it's bringing all these people together. And so it really helps the startups to, as well as talk to each other, so they can also be in contact with the other people that come through the space. Um, we provide training. Uh, we run a number of training courses. We uh, have sort of flagship, if you like, courses, uh, five day open data in practice, which will take you from zero to hero in open data. Um, we do uh, a, short, a short day course, open data in a day. Uh, we do courses on licensing. Uh, we're doing a course in um, uh, June or July, which is around um, open data technologies. Uh, I'll be doing a session on that. Uh, we also uh, help with community building. We host we host meetings for people who are uh, interested in open data. And we do talk similar to, similar to what I'm doing now. Um, every Friday we do lunchtime lectures, and that's uh, that's available for anyone to come along to. And uh, we we have we host uh, we host speakers every Friday lunchtime, and. Uh, research and policy. We uh, we uh, we contribute to um, uh, to consultations. We uh, we feedback on consultations, and we uh, we work together with uh, with government and um, and the private sector to uh, to shape uh, open data policy. Uh, and also software and service development, which I've sort of shown you, and which is my area really. <coughs> so um, how do we develop this software? We uh, we work in the open. Um, we started in January 2013, got a mixture of uh, skills. We did have a data scientist, but he's since moved on, he's now our head of research. Um, but we have a statistician um, and public data, which is me. We've got uh, a DevOps guy, although he's now a head of, his uh, title is head of robots, because DevOps is a, um, a culture, not a deliverable. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, software engineering. Um, we build tools for open data. Uh, we we share best practice and we have an open culture. Everything is in the in the open, and I'll uh, explain that as I go on. Um, so when we when we first convened as a team, we started by defining our principles, um, who we are, and what we believe. We believe in legibility, puns, <laughs> agile, and then yeah, there, there are some sensible ones there as well. Um, and how that translates. Uh, that translates into practice. Uh, I think Lego is an important one there. Eating your own dog food and other people. Eating your own dog food is about um, <laughs> is about when we develop tools, we use them ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and we are open by default. Uh, we encourage public engagement. We plan in the open. All our all our planning is carried out on GitHub. Um, we open up tickets for 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 our stories. Um, and uh, we encourage comments, forks, and contributions on our um, on our on our code. Uh, we always take the approach that there are more good ideas in the world than there are in the ODI. Um, this is a quote from a uh, head of robots, Sam. Uh, he wrote a uh, blog post about um, about our open culture. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like we're running around naked. <laughs> But uh, one of our one of our main principles is we borrow mercilessly. We build on other people's work. We avoid reinvention. So if you think we're uh, we're going too far down a particular rabbit hole, you think, hang on, someone must have done this before. Uh, so we're focusing our efforts into new areas. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. You just you find yourself. You think you think no one's actually done this. We are we are breaking new ground here. So that's what we really try and do. But we always, as well as nicking other people's stuff, we always try and make sure. Uh, we contribute back. We have um, we aim to commit to at least two open source projects a month. Um, and we don't always hit that target, but that's 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 the uh, that's the aim. And uh, we show appreciation for what people have done. We uh, experiment and learn because uh, because agile. Uh, we try new tools and ways of working, um, and then we have uh, we we have a. Uh, at the end of each uh, two-week sprint, we um, we have a retrospective. We talk about what went well, um, what didn't go well, and if it didn't go well, we just got to change it. We change it. Um, continuous improvement, basically. Uh, we share everything. 
Uh, we document and discuss experiences. We try and blog a lot. Uh, we don't do it as much as we should. But um, yeah, and also create reusable components. We've got, I, I, I can't remember exactly how many repos we've got on GitHub, but it's well into the hundreds now. Um, so if there's anything that we're doing and it seems like it might have a, um, it might, ha might, might be handy to reuse it, or other people might find it useful. We break it out into a into a gem and publish it on GitHub, uh, and we try and share learning uh, to help others, like through through blog posts. Uh, we also we are ourselves. We are all individuals. Um, we work as a team in the community, uh, but we are allowed to express our individual opi opinions, which coming from the local government uh, sector is really, really, really refreshing. Uh, and it, but obviously, do it uh, considerately. <coughs> so the practicalities, we are agile approach, open tools, open communication and open collaboration. I'll talk about those a bit more. Um, so open tools. Uh, GitHub. Everything is in GitHub, as I mentioned before. We plan in GitHub, we code in GitHub. We don't, as much as we'd love to give GitHub, GitHub some money, we don't have any closed repos. We took the decision not to have any closed repos because we thought, well, even if there is a reason for ha having it closed, we really need, we, we'll start making excuses and we'll start getting lazy. So we, we're, uh, we don't. And so this is our GitHub page. Um, that number there is out of date. We've got 82, that's from about six months ago, so we're going to be looking at about 150 repos now. Um, but the thing that we love GitHub for most is, uh, is the pull request model. Um, and there's a, a presentation linked here from Zach Holman, which I watched on my first day at uh, the ODI, uh, Zach Holman from GitHub. And it just talks about how GitHub works, it's um, short, focused, pull requests, always going back into master, and always taking the, um, the approach that master is always deployable, and uh, that's pretty much what we do deploy regularly. Anytime master gets changed, I'll talk about this a bit more, but anytime master gets changed, that, that gets, uh, that gets um, deployed. So uh, the workflow is clone the repository, create a branch, write some code with tests, uh, publish the branch, and open a pull request back to master. And that's, we aim for them on, on average probably about four or five pull requests a day. And uh, GitHub called this the GitHub flow. Um, we'll return to this theme later. So here's an example. Um, my colleague James aimed for the PR on uh, some code. Um, you can see the files that, that have changed, and the actual changes in the code for the diff. Um, and then the PR is not just about here's my code, it's a way to facilitate a discussion. So we, are, we usually open the PR on the first commit and a further commit has been made halfway through with a description of what change, what's changed. It's like a comment thread but without the shouting. Uh, and then the PR is merged. And that is the last time any human has touched the code. But more of that later. So um, robots. Robots are very important to us. As I said, the uh, DevOps guy is uh, the head of robots. So we have continuous deployment. It's been a holy grail for a long time, but it's always been too scary to attempt. If you're looking at it halfway through a project and you've just got, you know, servers, which uh, we talk about, um, DevOps people talk about the um, the concept of a snowflake. When you've uh, once you've deployed a server and you've started uh, started adding various libraries to it and done various things to it, it's um, we, it, it's as beautiful and unique as a snowflake. And there's no way that you could go back to that uh, um, and rebuild it. <laughs> so as we were starting from scratch, we, bake, we decided to bake in continuous deployment from the beginning. Um, we did use Jenkins for continuous integration, uh, but we're starting to move away from, uh, from Jenkins as it's one more thing to manage and started using Travis, which is a ho basically a hosted uh, continuous improvement uh, integration um, service. And again, it's free for open source projects. So it checks out the code, runs the test, <coughs> and uh, now we can hook it into GitHub, and uh, you can see the branch has passing tests. And uh, we talk, so Jenkins has told us the code is good to go, and we need to get it out into the wild. 
Um, in the bad old days, we'd uh, own a bunch of servers, which we'd have to look, look after and care for for a number of times, and deploy them probably by hand, which is error prone and unpleasant, which is why you normally have one day when you, uh, when you deploy. Um, the classic Snowflake anti -pan. Uh We have uh, ephemeral cloud servers, which we can treat as cats or not as pets. They start playing up, shoot them in the head, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and build enough one from scratch. So uh, when a um, when a when a master passes, uh, we add uh, we we add a tag to it in GitHub, and Chef picks it up. We we used to use Chef. Um, Chef picks it up and deploys it. So we also use a lot of uh, code tools to keep our code up to scratch. Oh. Uh, we use code, code climate to get us thinking about how elegant our code is. Uh, that's, that, that's all right, actually. We've got a couple of Ds. So um, I do often find myself refactoring constantly just to stop code climate complaining. <laughs> but uh, it does help you keep your methods nice and short and focused, and, and it, is, it is quite useful. Um, and yeah, Code Climate also lets us know about security issues. We also uh, have Gymnasium, which lets us know when our dependencies are up to date. But that's becoming increasingly um, increasingly irrelevant now because we have uh, another robot called Bimble, which runs on our Jenkins box every Wednesday, clones down our repos, um, runs bundle update, which in Ruby just updates all your, updates all your dependencies, pushes a branch to GitHub, then um, Travis picks that up, runs the tests, as tests pass, we know that uh, we, we always keep, try and keep our coverage um, at least 90%, so we know the tests pass. The, uh, there's been no nastiness introduced in, uh, in any of the updates. And, uh, and if it goes green, it gets merged, so it just helps us keep our uh, dependencies up to date and uh, everything nice and secure. Um, oh, fault bomb. Is a 20% project. We we have a 20% uh, project, 20% uh, time. But we started out doing this um, one day a week, every Friday. But it just wasn't working because we we were too focused on what was going on in that in that given sprint. So we have um, we have two two week sprints, and then we have a one week 20% um, sprint. Innovate, we'll call it innovation time, but we're supposed to be innovating all the time. But we haven't thought of a better time, <laughs> better title for that. Um, but Fort Bomb is a um, project we worked on just before Christmas. It keeps um, our fault our and other people's forks up to date in a similar way to Bimble. It opens a pull request at a given frequent frequency, so every every week, every two weeks, every month, um, from the base repo to our fork. Um, which is very useful for our website because we um, we use the same code base as uh, gov.uk for our website, so um, there's a lot of forks going on there. So that just helps us keep keep our forks up to date and uh, and make sure because the further you get away from for the the harder it is to bring in changes. So that's just a nice little project. It's still an alpha experiment, like, like much of our stuff. Um, and for communication. Uh, we've got completely open our IRC channel. Um, this is pretty much where we work. We work in IRC. We're a distributed team. I'm, I'm based up in Birmingham, but our office is in Shoreditch. So, um, but it is open to anyone. Anyone can come in and and, uh, and shoot a fat with us on, on IRC. Um, there's two people there who don't actually work at the ODI, um, having a discussion that's only tangentially re related to ODI stuff. Um, We've got a robot in our IRC channel that can remind us when stand-ups are happening, describe things that happen on GitHub, like when a pull request has been opened, and show us pictures of Apple and Uh It will do more in the future when we actually find the time. Uh, we also have dash, uh, a number of dashboards. Um, this one keeps track of all our branches, uptime, and GitHub stacks in a dashboard, which we have in the office on the screen running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, our CEO loved them so much. He had us do dashboards for the whole organisation. We've got about 12 dashboards now, um, showing lots of numbers and money things that I don't quite understand. Um, open collaboration. Uh, we, um, working in the open, allows things like this to happen. This came about when uh, Open Data Certificates was just 
pretty much an idea on a, a technical director's laptop. Um, someone say, "Well, I'd like to. I'd like a Russian translation." And uh, and uh, my boss said, uh, "Yes, we need the um, certificates for different languages and different jurisdictions. So go go right ahead." And that resulted in a pull request, and now we have a Russian version of um, Open Data certificates. And uh, also, the uh, we we have a Russian uh, Open Data Institute now. So. So working in the open stops us getting corners, catches more mistakes, gives us better results, <coughs> helps us find collaborators, gives something back, and is fun. And that's uh, that's me. Uh, any questions? How does one <coughs> discover, or, or do you help people discover what data is available? That's um, that that is a. Interesting question because um, we there is data.gov.uk, um, but we are we also I, I'm sort of I'm a little bit unsure about data catalogues because I think really you should be publishing your data along with the stuff. So you know if you if you go to a website you add. I mean, one of the first things I do with a lot of websites or with lots, lots of services, I'll stick .json on the end and see if I get get data. So it's about discoverability, um, and I mean, I think data catalogs do help there, but I think often they can they can seem unwieldy and they can seem difficult. I mean, we we do try we do try and help gather awareness of open data, and hopefully, I mean. The thing is, you, you think about uh, there's been you think about how the web was, you know, 20 years ago. There were very few websites, very difficult to find them, and I think we're we're starting to put put everyone on the journey towards making open data the new normal. And um, so it will. There's been talk about a Google for data, and I mm. think that's that's certainly something that um, that we'd like to see, but it's. It's how, how to get there, and I think part of that journey is making open data the new normal, and also being able to link data sets together. Uh, I mean, I don't know how familiar anyone uh, you guys are with uh, with the concept of linked data. Um, it can seem unwieldy and sort of um, sort of astronauty a little bit, but actually it's very very simple. And we're trying to put people on again, put people on the journey towards the data rather than saying you must publish everything in RDF, you must have a triple store. Um, but you know, introducing concepts such as having a URI for everything just makes it a lot easier to be able to uh, to link data sets together, and that will that will aid discoverability. I think. No, I mean, isn't it required? If they're going to certify the data, yeah. they have to then go to you to certify it. Yeah. So couldn't some kind of cataloging of that data happen? That is point? something that we've been thinking about actually. It's about, uh, we do we, we do obviously have a uh, we, we have a, a database full of data sets. So that is something that we'd uh, that was one of the, the ideas towards the end game of, of having a Google for data was encouraging more people to certify their data so then we know the data the data's out there. Um, so that's certainly that's certainly something that we're uh, that we're thinking about. It's something that's, uh, that's on our on our radar. You, you said you use uh, third-party libraries like you've got to embed it, you know, Yeah, it's not it's always out there somewhere. Yeah. How do you cover things like GPL three and such like when they they put a restriction on you for new distribution? Yeah, we 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 tend to. Um, I haven't seen many GPL3 libraries, to be honest. Okay. We, um, I think a lot of stuff that's out there, uh, I'm trying to think of the um, the license that we use, MIT, a lot of the stuff yeah. is MIT licensed okay. these days. So um, I've seen a couple of GPL3 ones and we just have to so take the view that we... It's a GPL problem. Yeah, okay. that we can't use that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, a lot of stuff uh, seems to be MIT licensed okay. now. So.